the broye pojolovot. Uh, yeah, so I was warned not to speak Russian here. The, if, there might be bandera somewhere. <laughs> so I will just talk in English, in plain English. So I'm French, uh, but I'm working in Switzerland. And since, yeah, Philip put some slides about his country, so I put slides on countries. <laughs> So, yeah, if you think about Switzerland, it's money, dinghy everywhere. Uh, obviously, this is not the reason I work there. Um, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, um, this is the reason. That might be one reason, of course, you know about Swiss chocolate, but uh, uh, yeah, the real stuff is, is for this reason, right? The nice Alps, the mountains, the ski and stuff. Okay, um, so I'm Nicolas Frankel, I'm a French Java developer, architect, yeah, whatever you want me to do guy. Um, yeah, generally it likes that, like, yeah, you are an expert because you read something on the meta. Okay, so I will do it. Um, I, I've always been consulting, like I'm working since 15 years and I've always been a consultant, so I go somewhere. I try to fix problem and then I go away faster because I created more problems, obviously. Um, right now I'm working for SAP, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I, 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 in fact, I worked for a company called Hybris. Who knows about Hybris? Yeah, nearly, uh, well, out of the room. That's great. Philip, no, your vote is not counting. Um, and we, we have been bought by SAP, so Ibris is an e-commerce platform based on, on Spring and Java. Okay, this is the introduction. So you are here to listen to me talk about Spring Boots and Kotlin, obviously. So this guy in the corner is Phil Webb, is the lead Spring Boots and he described the Spring Framework as such. You've got nice ingredients and it's up to you to do the cooking itself. So you've got every piece that you need. And yeah, when I did Spring Project, when I kickstarted them, I wanted no one. I did my own Maven Palm. It took me between half a day and two days, depending on the complexity. I hacked my stuff together, made sure everything was perfect. I was super happy. And then came the developers and they created problems and I had to fix them every time. And yeah, that's a real problem with Spring. It takes a long time to kickstart a project. So you have Maven templates and stuff like that. And this is Spring Boots. And Spring Boots, it's not me, it's his saying that it is a ready-made cake. And basically afterwards you can add more uh, sugar on top and stuff, but it's really baked. It's already out of the box. Who here has already played with Spring Boots? Yeah, great, nearly everyone. Who here has already made Spring Boot applications? Okay, great, so I will skip the rest. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Spring Boot is about convention of our configuration, it's super easy. And the next part of the talk is about Kotlin. Kotlin is a not so new, but let's say that it's known for a, a not so long time, a language made by JetBrains. JetBrains is the company behind, behind IntelliJ, behind TeamCity, behind uh, ReShopper and all the uh, nice IDE that you use right, in, in whatever language. And they, have, they had a problem. Basically, you know that Java, who here is not a Java developer? Okay, so for the rest, <laughs> you know that Java is super verbose and you create a lot and it's, it's not only verbose but Java involves a lot of ceremony. Hmm? You have to, to do things in the, th in the way the compilers want you to do things. Basically at some point you sometimes replace the compiler because you have to add information because the compiler is not smart enough to do that. And this guy at JetBrains thought, yeah, it's hard to maintain our IDEs when it involves millions on, of, of lines of code of Java. So what if we add something which was simpler to use? Of course, there they were available choices. I mean, there, there is Scala. Scala. Who here likes Scala? Okay. 
<laughs> not so many. No, it's too late. Your vote is not counting again. <laughs> there was Groovy, which is a scripting language, which, yeah, there is a lot ceremony, uh, uh, less, let, less ceremony involved. But nothing was really relevant. So they decided to create their own language. And now you have Kotlin. And the great things about Kotlin, yeah, there are many great things, but basically, fact is it's open source. So again, you can check, there is not the same stuff. It's very disturbing. When you click on the camera, it's very disturbing that I see the flash there. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> Do it now! <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you won't find the same stuff as in Java, like uh, it will involve Oracle releasing byte by part by part some open source, but still keeping. Uh, Kotlin is open source from the start. Everything is open source. The compiler is open source, the API, everything. So no fear about that. Also, that is very important. It is compiled to byte codes. You don't need to add another runtime, another. You have Java already in your infrastructure. Everything is ready for Java. Then Kotlin can come in, just like Scala or Groovy. You don't need other runtimes. You don't, don't need other stuff. Initially, and it's still the case, they still want to compile to JavaScript. Right now it's experimental. We are at uh, the version of 1.1 of Kotlin. Um, still, they don't advise you to, to do it in production. So you can play with it. I don't, didn't play with it because I'm not so happy about JavaScript, but uh, yeah, so you can still do it. And here are Kotlin main features. So if it looks like Scala, it's really because it's it's, it has the same advantages, my, in my opinion, and if you are a Scala developer, we can discuss about it, uh, but without all the, I would say, all the complicated stuff. So basically, it is object-oriented, like Java. It's also functionally oriented, so it has Lambda out of the box, right from its inception. It is, of course, statically typed, which I like. I mean, I, I want the compiler to do as much as possible for me. I don't want to create tests just to check that, uh, yeah, the type is right, that I didn't change the type, like in JavaScript. Um, the problem of null is handled in an elegant way. You have types, different types, whether the value can be null or not. So you don't have optional, you really have different types. So if you have a type that cannot be null, let's say string, it's string. If you have a type that can be null, then it's string question mark. And those are different types. And they don't iterate from one another. So it can really enforce in your way of developing that, yeah, it, is, it, it can be null or it cannot be null. And you don't think like in Java, yeah, okay, so it's not optional, but how can I be sure? I mean, how can you be sure besides looking at the code itself? It's not possible. Yeah, so they also solve the problem of checked exception. There is no checked exception. I mean, it, it was, uh, checked exception are a good idea, right? They, they, they are meant to enforce, yeah, you are all, as, as he said, you are all young people and I'm old, sorry for you, yeah, you are still young in your mind. And, um, but um, I, I, when I was younger, I, I, we really thought that it was a great idea to have checked exception because it forces a developer to handle something, to think about, yeah, this can go wrong. Because before, I mean, when you write stuff in C or C++, or, or, or C++ I mean, yeah, the happy path. Every time, let's read a file. Yeah, but what is the file is not there? No, it will be there. <laughs> not so sure. Okay, so it was a great idea. Of course, when you have got some experience, you realize, yeah, the, the idea was great, but the implementation is not really good. So, okay, Java, sorry for you, but the check subscription, it was a great idea, bad implementation, let's forget about it. Um, also, like in Scala, we are, uh, in Kotlin, we have named arguments, which are great. I mean, if you are a lot of arguments and 
all of them are string, which is bad when you are doing object-oriented programming, but you can name them so you don't have to think about the order. It makes your, your code much more readable, much more maintainable. And if you add to that the fact that we have optional, so you have, can have default value, you don't need to do like in Java for one, of, um, one method to call another method which has more parameters providing the default stuff. It, it, it's in one method you can have everything, so named and optional arguments. It's really great when you're writing application. Of course, like I said, we have lambda, extension function. Extend function function is, if only for this reason, you should switch to Kotlin. I will show you afterwards. I have a dedicated slide and example for that because it's really, really great. <coughs> also, something that really I don't like in, in Scala is about Java interoperability. Having an application that has both Java and Scala at the same time is really hard to get. Calling Java stuff from Scala is not nice. Calling Scala stuff from Java is even worse. <laughs> uh, so you know what I mean. Um, and yeah, so the only, then the only thing that you can do is create a new Scala application. And it's very hard to have like a slow migration path and slow migration path are better because they are safer. You don't want to migrate your application in one big shot. And if you don't do that, that means that it will be very hard to maintain. And we want to have better maintainability. So, again, back from the start in the language is a very, very deep Kotlin and Java integration. It's a no-brainer to call one from the other. So, let's say you are convinced that let's use Kotlin. What are the main benefits of that? The fact is, I told you about Java verbosity, about Java ceremony. I don't like this verbosity and conciseness. I prefer ceremony and expressiveness because I, I, I already wrote about it in some of my articles that, yeah, shorter is not always better. Who laughed here? Again? The, the same here. <clears throat> yeah, for, for, for languages, for code, one might think, at least the Scala guy think that, yeah, shorter is better because, yeah, you can be so concise. So instead of using a descriptive method name, you would, need, you would use an operator. <laughs> yeah, like uh, dot, dot, joker, joker. And you are supposed to know what it means. Like for left, like uh, slash joker. Hmm, interesting. So I'm supposed to know what slash joker means. In Kotlin, you can override operators, but only a limited subset. So the list is written. So you can override plus, because everybody knows what plus means, right? Right. <laughs> you, you can override minus, you can override divide, multiple, but not slash joker dot question mark. It's not possible. Nobody knows what it means. So it removes the implicitness. Um, through extension function, again, I, I, it's a teaser, you can have an improved object-oriented way of coding. And really that is, I, I'm fundamentally for this feature. It, it, it's really great. And yeah, of course you can do functional. So who doesn't know about Kotlin? Nothing. Who knows a little choo choo? <laughs> Who is already a Kotlin master? <laughs> no, I'm not a Kotlin master. I was giving, I was going to give the guy the, the stuff because I'm not a Kotlin master. I just, I'm just, a, I like to play. So really, I, I really want to try. Before I do something I, in production, I want to try. So here is a very simple Kotlin. Yeah, you know, hello world. Hey, let's do hello world in Kotlin. Yeah, um, here. The first stuff is like groovy, like Scala, re remove the semicolons. Of course you can add them if you really want them. But I mean, why do we always, I mean Java, have to have a semicolon and a line break? Why? To satisfy the compiler. But the compiler is a tool, is not my master, is a slave. I want it to be a slave. 
So he should understand after some points that no, when I have a, a, a line break, it means semicolon. So Kotlin baked out of the blue means semicolon, no, line break is enough. Okay? Also, <coughs> why in God's name do we have static methods in Java? Because you think that sometimes something is not related to a class. Sometimes, like string utils, string utils, it's related to string, but I mean, it could be anything. You are, in many of your projects, at least in many of mine, that I didn't create those classes, of course, I could way cleaner than that, I could never do that. But we put stuff in utils class, put stuff. And basically, it has nothing, it's not related to object-oriented programming at all. It's just to put stuff that you want, and because Java wants us to put code in methods. Code cannot exist outside of methods, and methods are related to a class. It's like that. So, in Kotlin, we don't have methods, we have functions. And functions can be related to classes or not. Function can live outside of classes. And here we see that there is no, no class at all. We can declare a function at the top level namespace. <coughs> the example, the most important one, is a main method in a Java application. You have to have a public static void main method in a class. But you never use the class itself. Where is the object-oriented programming in that? No, it's just the entry point. And because Java doesn't allow you to have, yeah, free function, you have to put that in a class. So here, no class, just a function, the main function. <coughs> the types you put there after the name. I still have problems doing that. Most of the time I type, the, I, because yeah, I've written for 15 years, I've written Java, so I, first it's like in, ingrained in my brain, type the name. Yeah, but in UML, you first type the name, then the type. Who is not doing UML? Uh, yeah, the other are too ashamed, but probably there are more. Who is doing UML? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, so it kind of is consistent with UML stuff. So it's, you just need to get used to it, but afterwards it's, it's easier. Uh, no, don't die on us, please. <laughs> I just want to finish my presentation, right? One hour, then we can discuss again. Um, you can have an array, and array is not a specific like with brackets. You have a type that is called array, and guess what? It's a generic type. And arrays can contain strings, integers, whatever. And here, yeah, we have no written type. Because the compiler is smart enough to understand that here we don't return I mean, why isn't the Java compiler smart enough to understand that? Because it was written a long time ago. A long time ago, when we thought that the programmer should be the slave of the compiler, not the other way around. But I'm free. I mean, we invented the revolution. We French people, we should be proud <laughs> about that. So let's do the revolution about the Java compiler. I, want, I don't want to type the written type when it's not required. And here, it's not required. I don't return nothing. I mean, I just print a line. Does not require a void. Sorry? Does this mean void only? The, it means that it, in that case, I could have typed two dots for return and units. It's like in Scala. That's the same keyword. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it's useless. It's useless for anyone who would call my API, it's useless for the compiler, it's just Java ceremony, right? So straightforward. So, a 
extensions. Extensions are really the way, the, the, re the reason, if only for this reason, for you to try Kotlin. Not to love it, not to use it, but just to try it. And once you try it, you will be really convinced. Basically, you have two extension stuff. The extension method and extension property. Let's just focus on extension methods. You want to add behavior to an existing type. You don't want to inherit from a type and add the behavior. You want to add behavior to an existing type. But isn't that, it's contrary to object-oriented programming. You cannot do that. You don't want to add behavior to an existing type. Yes, you want. Otherwise, why do you have string utils method? That's basically what you want to do when you create string utils stuff. And since you cannot do that, you add a static method that has string as a first parameter and a lot of other stuff as parameters. But that's exactly what you want to do when you create string utils method and that utils and whatever. Yeah. And what about encapsulation? Let me finish, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good point, but let, let me finish. And I will show you that it doesn't break encapsulation. So, I want to add behavior on an existing type without breaking encapsulation. <laughs> I, I just want to keep the class as it is. I, would just, I just want to add, not to change, to add. Okay. So, in Java, I create a string utils, date utils, whatever utils method. And it's not so nice. So, who uses log4g? Dva. Good. Probably it won't be so interesting for you. Um, and who uses SLF4j? Okay. So, who didn't ha put his end up before? No, you did already. I saw you. Who didn't, who would never put up his hand in whatever I asked? You, what do you use? I don't do CR. Sorry? I'm not a Java developer. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> you are very courageous, bravo. What, what are you developing in? Uh, dot, net. dot net. Good, perfect. That, that's very mind opening. <laughs> No, really, I mean, I wouldn't go to a, a, a dot .NET conference, Those, that's really good. Um, okay, so the problem with log4j is, let's see that you want to log something, right? And you want to log something that is not computed yet, like a toString, for example. Okay, so you will have to compute toString and to aggregate it with the message you want to send. Okay? The problem with that is that if the two string is a heavy computation, it will take time. Hmm? So, generally, as an architect, I advise my developers to, if the method is expensive to compute, then you should wrap your call in a if logger dot is debug enabled, info enabled, whatever, the right level, and only call the method if I'm at this level of logging. Makes sense. The problem with that is that it clutters your code. Logging is orthogonal. I mean, it's not business related. It doesn't help me understand what the code does. So it just clutters your code. <laughs> You don't have many solutions, right? You can use object-oriented, um, aspect-oriented programming to create aspects, to cut the, through this. It's harder and junior developers won't be so happy and they won't understand many stuff and it's all feel magical. So, if the computation is heavy, you have no way of really getting that. SLF4J, however, lets you do only the aggregation, the plus, the string concatenation, 
only if you are already at the right level. So it's a little step better, you only de do the concatenation, but you still, in whatever case, you will do the computation of the method. What are the possibilities? Gumburger again? In Java 8, what are the possibilities, guys? Lambda has... Uh, we, can write graphs. we can pass function. You can pass function. You can pass lambdas. And they will only be computed at the real moment. Okay? That's good. And, but you are still using, already using, a logging framework. So how can you call logger dot something and pass a lambda? The API is fixed. The API cannot be changed. Extension function. Extension function, yeah. Stop using my stuff, that's mine. You shouldn't do that. No, in Java you would use a utils class, logger utils, hey. Logger utils dot static method logger and you pass a logger plus the stuff, plus the lambda. That's super useless. Comes Kotlin, right? And here is, yeah, it's always the same stuff. Look, here, let's look at this stuff. <coughs> I think it's big enough for Taras Khvetit. <laughs> this is big enough for anyone to see. Okay, so here I, oh, oh, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's fun. Let's do it again. So this is what I want you to read. Okay. So here I create a function. So it's, it's very funny. We said that Kotlin is fun because a function is defined with the fun keyword. Yeah, it's... Yeah, we are programmers. You have to allow us that. Um, so we define a function. And see here, we say that it extends logger. So the rest is the same. So you pass in a lambda, and the lambda basically just returns a string, takes nothing as an argument. Oh, here you should also see. Um, yeah, I noticed that when Philip talked, that now he's playing with his phone, he only looked at you people, ignoring the rest of the room. That's not, that's not nice. I will talk to you more, just for this. Uh, okay, so here. I pass a lambda that takes nothing at an argument and returns a string. So this is a lambda. This is Java 8 lambda, like you, I would define it anywhere. And here, inside the function, I use what I would do that in my Java code, like if is debug enabled, I would debug and invoke the lambda. So if I'm not debug enabled, I would never invoke the lambda, and thus I would never call the heavy computation stuff. And just by doing logger dot in front, that will mean that I will just add this on an existing class. And about encapsulation, that is interesting because here is debug enabled and debug are part of the public API. I'm not breaking encapsulation, I'm only calling public stuff. Basically, I'm wrapping a new behavior by calling just public stuff. So I don't break encapsulation. And now, in my Kotlin code, I can just write logger.debug and pass a lambda. A lambda that returns a string. So by just writing these three lines of code, Everywhere in my application where I import this namespace, I can use logger.debug and pass a lambda. What does it mean in, in line modifier? Okay, so inline means that during compiling, it will replace everywhere where I use logger.debug, it will replace it with this. That means that it's even better because it means like it's, it would be like uh, 
uh, compile time AOP, not runtime AOP, so I won't get any performance issue, no overhead, and I, I, I will get the nice way of typing, of writing. Uh, okay, can you do this with the existing method? Existing, sorry? Uh, what, what if uh, the logger already has... Uh, that, 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 that's a problem. I cannot do that because it would break encapsulation. Because basically, in the end, the, the, the bytecode would just create a new team's method that calls that. So I have the good way of typing, but I have compatibility with Java, because Java developers who would like to use this, the library can use it. Now they would have to write... I don't even see the name of the file. SLF4K utils kt dot debug and pass first the argument the logger and second the lambda. So it's compatible. Of course, if you are using Java, even Java 8, you won't have the nice way of typing, but still it's possible. And this is only for this reason you should try Kotlin. Really, it, it makes for a nicer object-oriented code. And if you are lazy, Kakia, um, this is already part of a library that I created and I did it like in one evening. And you just import the library if you use Kotlin and afterwards you can use logger.debug, logger what info, whatever, and pass lambdas instead of passing the string. Or if you don't, don't need it, just pass the string. Both are acceptable. Once you import the library, both are possible. So extension methods are super great. The, I mean, this is genius. And it doesn't break encapsulation, it's still the same GVM bytecode, it's compatible with Java. Really good. What about if the library adds this kind of method later? Sorry? What if the library adds uh, the method with the same signature later? No, it, it, ah. What would you do with this? Then, then you have to follow a little. But probably it's not for that. That's what I told that Log4j2 people are not interested in that because Log4j2 people, in, it's already part of the API that they uh, accept a lambda. But again, it's for the migration path. You are still using less LF4j. You don't want to migrate to Log4j2 now, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps not. But you still want to gain performance, not to do heavy computation. Just write that in three lines and you're done. I mean, it complicates the upgrade path because you cannot always upgrade the code that uses this in mind feature. Like, say, it's other team in your company that did that, you cannot upgrade the library. You are talking about, about library version management. Yeah. yeah. So, basically, do you already do that or not? I mean, if you are using a library, when are you upgrading? in your application? Do you upgrade daily, monthly? Depends. Yeah, sometimes daily. And so every time you upgrade, you run the risk of having a non-compatible change, of having a breaking change. So either you already do it and you know how to manage it, or you don't do it and it won't change anything. So the talk is about Spring Boot and Kotlin. I, I, who is now super interested in Kotlin? <laughs> oh, I, I can't go away. I mean, we have time and you can enjoy the afternoon. Uh. <laughs> OK, anyway. So this talk is about Kotlin and Spring Boot. And I believe that both can benefit from one another. The thing is, first is, you can have Kotlin integration out of the box with Spring Boot already, right now. You don't even know it, but you can. Um, who writes XML for Spring configuration? Good. But now, a really, really interesting and serious question. Who uses auto annotated classes? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> who uses who uses configuration classes? Java config. Great. And the other? Don't use Spring like you. You okay? I expect you. <laughs> who uses something else to configure a Spring application like Groovy? Okay. Great. Um, and the problem with Java configuration classes, yeah, they are meant to replace XML, they are compile time safe, which is good, but basically they are super taras. Big. Yeah, super big. Huh? And that's the problem. You, you, it, it's very hard to read them. You have a lot of stuff. So at some point you have to create fragments of configuration like you would do in XML. Uh, still, it's not super nice. So, what can we do? We can create our own stuff. So, let's create, or uh, it's already done. I won't do some live coding. I will pretend I will be live coding and you will pretend I am live coding. Um, basically, I will just use Git for that. Uh, so, the first stuff to do is to, to use the Spring Initializer. Who knows about the Spring Initializer? So, do you use it to create your Spring Boot project? Yeah, so that's great. So here you would say like uh, UA dot uh, uh, lohi, uh, lohika and uh, yeah, no, haka um, and Spring Boot stuff and it's great. And you would now generate your project. No, because you want to do Kotlin. So you have to switch to the fuel version and here you can see that you can use Kotlin there. Aha, uh -huh, we knew about it. <laughs> Good. One is following the news. Uh, okay. Now, so I don't want to go and select stuff. So basically what I can do is I can use this shortcut and here you can see that you can already pre-select the language. If you didn't know about it. Uh, okay. So this is easy and of course you can have the same stuff when you are inside IntelliJ and you create a new project and you want to use the Spring Initializer and here of course, uh, yeah, then you've got the internet stuff. At some point you can choose Kotlin, believe me, trust me. Okay, so let's switch projects and I will start from the boot Kotlin demo stuff. So this is what we have. This is a skeleton of our application. And here you can see in the POM, it's super easy. We've got the normal standard stuff. Only this time, you can see that we have the JetBrains Kotlin plugin. And it is already configured to say, yeah, let's use Kotlin for that. So here you can see that I have created an application. The main function is outside it. Here, the application as, as in Java, as a, as a Spring Boot application annotation, and it works. Now, the only problem with that is how to launch it. Because so far, IntelliJ doesn't understand super well how it works. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so you have to tell it not to use the Kotlin class, but to use the Java class. Because when you've got this kind of stuff, then again, here, if you've got a function that is not attached to a class and Java makes sure that it's always attached to a class, then you have to find a way to make it compatible with Java. In that, in that case, then the Kotlin compiler will create a, your, your um, name dot, uh, kt dot class. So you can use this trick and then you can launch the application like that. So just write, uh, just append KT at the end. Now let's go further. This is my next step. I will add a REST controller. Yeah, sorry about that. I just removed it. I didn't compile it. I add a new class. Who knows about the, the, the REST controller that can be tweeted? It because it's below 140 characters? Yeah. So uh, at some point, yeah, people were so proud to say, yeah, we create a REST controller with Spring, it takes less one, 
140 characters to do and they, they try to do that in a tweet. It was just a joke, but here that's exactly what I, I, I did. I mean, it, it's super small stuff. And of course, at this point, if I run that, I can have this hello stuff. And it only requires 50 megabytes of dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> I will disregard your comments because it's rude and I thought you were sleeping as well. <laughs> Okay, who is counting? <laughs> Are you paying for the hard drive? I mean, what do you care? It's in the cloud, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so again, here I have a, a, a Kotlin class. What can I do better? Basically, what can I do better is this kind of stuff. Here, it returns a string, and I told you previously that I mean, it's not necessary to tell it that it returns a string. So I can do it like that. But then it complains, yeah, hey, guys, when you don't write anything, it means write, it, re it returns nothing. And here you return a string. Blin. <laughs> He's not happy. So I will just say that, yeah, since it's a one-liner, I can say it like that. And that is super nice, especially regarding Java configuration. And Scala people should be happy when they see that because it looks exactly like Scala stuff. Are you happy? Absolutely. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I like to make Scala developers happy. Uh, <laughs> and here, this is, this is exactly the stuff. So with Kotlin, you can create one-liners. And your Java configuration basically shouldn't be something else. You shouldn't have if, then, else, in, yeah, then, else, yeah, then probably not. But you, you shouldn't have if, else in your configuration classes. It should be super straightforward. It should be always return you something, right? This is what you do in your configuration classes. And this is exactly what Kotlin is done for. So that was my next step, sorry. And here, of course, everything that you can do in Java, you can do in Kotlin, but even more. We can pass parameter in Spring MVC, right? And then you would need to concatenate them here if you wanted to greet someone. But with Kotlin, as in Groovy, as in Scala, you've got string interpolation. So you don't need to aggregate stuff, to concatenate stuff. You just write and you are using this dollar syntax and it works. And even here, you don't need the braces. You just can, it, can write it like that. You just need braces if you have dotted annotation of if you're calling something which a method or something. If you are just calling a variable name, you just write its dollar and it works. Pretend I'm live coding. Be impressed with my coding skills, please. <laughs> uh, here I added a new controller again and I want to return not a string, this time I want to return an object. Okay? Which is possible because at some point Spring will transform it to JSON stuff. Okay? Does it use JSON? It uses what? Who is speaking? Is speaking. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. Yeah, it uses, I think it uses Jackson by default, but of course you can configure, it's Spring Boot, so you can configure in whatever uh, stuff you want. I mean, you can always use like um, Extreme or whatever, but by default it uses Jackson because I think it's the most popular. The string is for old people, you know. It's very fitting. Yabudu Machu Kayus. <laughs> okay, 
Окей, я могу матюкаяться. Я знаю. So, you know that this is recorded, Taras. Yeah, but we have informal atmosphere. Okay, great. Um, so here, I want to, re to, to return something, and that something is defined in the same stuff, in the same file. So, here I created a class welcome. Again, for Scala developers, it's easy to understand that. For Java developers, it's super strange. No, really. Um, Java makes a difference between the class declaration and the constructor. But in 99% of the cases, you have either zero or one constructor. And you are, so you have a lot of ceremony involved. So for 1% of the case, you are adding noise to your understanding. And afterwards, you have to add your private fields, and you have to add your getter and your setters. Um, and you add to, to add this kind of stuff. And in the end, for only one or two fields, you've got a file this long. And this is super hard to read and to maintain and blah, blah, blah. So Kotlin knows about this. Scala also knows about this. But Kotlin knows about this. And so it says, OK. But what if this kind of stuff that is a repetitive pattern, we just integrate it into the grammar, into the syntax of the, of the language? So let's create a class. And we see that this class has a constructor which takes two parameters. The first one is a string. The second one is a string with a default value, again. So if I only pass, like here, I pass only a, a, a first par, uh, uh, the first parameter. So the second, by default, will be welcome. And again, Kotlin will create default getters for those out of the box. And if you see, there is here, it's written val, like value. In Kotlin, you have to define all variables with either val, value, meaning immutable, or var. And like its name implies, variable, mutable. So since here it's val, it's no use creating setters. And in Java, you can be very stupid. You can create, create final fields with setters, and the compiler will bitch about it. So you can write stuff that, is, that won't compile. And I mean, it's stupid, really. This question of mutability, immutability, is not part of the Java fundamentals. It's part of Kotlin. It's part of Scala. But let's forget about Scala, they are old. So here, in one line, we created a class which has two private fields, two string, OK, with setters. Getters. Yeah. Getters. Thanks, you are following, you too. The other, uh, I don't know. You are excused, you are excused. You. <laughs> okay? Uh, <but. coughs> you are no, yeah, excused. Uh, when you are creating a new object, uh, welcome with parameter who, uh, what is uh, injected automatically? But uh, what if you have uh, three parameters, who, what, and where? And you want to create an object only with uh, first and third parameters? Wait, 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 wait. Padajdi, Kralchonacek. What do you want exactly? In simple words, I will modify the code. Just tell, I, you want to add a third parameter? Yes, where? Where? OK, let's do that. Does it? It's not injected automatically. So there is no default value? Yes. OK. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> this is what you wanted. Yeah, that's cool. And this is named parameters with default parameters. And it's just ah, cool. Yeah. Kruta. Ochin <laughs> Kruta. Okay. 
Yeah, if you have questions, I can try to answer them. And yeah, I mean, it's live coding, right? Yeah. Uh, what about if you don't want to create uh, those uh, best indicators? Uh, but I, I, I don't want, I don't want. Uh, no, uh, you can tell for any class, like you can tell that you would, uh, I don't remember the syntax because I never do, do it, but you can every time say get, uh, I don't know, uh, foo, and you, I don't remember the syntax, but you can. No, 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 uh, I mean exactly the opposite thing. Okay. When you don't want them to be created, if you... Ah, okay, like that, like, okay. Yeah. Like, I want this is something that only belongs to me. Yeah. Then you cannot do, uh, you, you can, uh, wait. Uh, mm -mm. Then I have to create that, that, string. Uh, to, I, I want to make it compile in front of your eyes still. So here I will say return. And here I will say I will create a new, why doesn't, why is it bitching? Yeah, sure. It's bitching because of that. Um, and here I want to uh, put it into a, a, a variable. And here I cannot say welcome dot what. It doesn't exist because it's private. It's mine. It's not yours. So they, they could stolen all the things from Scala they could understand. <laughs> yeah. I, if you are a Scala developer, it will be a breeze to migrate to Kotlin. Yes. Yeah. What for? <laughs> because it is it is for normal people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a genius. I'm not a genius. I, I, when I read the Scala docs on collection, it hurts my little brain. <laughs> you know, it, it, there is a lot of upper lower bound uh, in, embedded together. The, the signature of the collection is just. A <laughs> I want to die after that. Really. I mean, I, I feel really stupid after reading Scala docs. <laughs> you are smart, it's good. I'm just normal. I just live in Switzerland for the money. <laughs> right? You have said that was not for money. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, <laughs> no, but no, uh, let's be serious. Really, I, I've, like I said, I have 15 years of experience. Um, I've worked with a lot of programmers. Some of them are real good, some of them are good, most are average, and not so few of them are bad. I wouldn't even trust anyone doing a, a, a real team effort to write Scala code if they are not like PhD. <laughs> it's not possible. I mean, it, re it, it really hurts the brain. I, I, you cannot create a language for the elites. You have to create a language for the average guy. That's the reason why Java is v very successful. Yes. Because Java is simple. I mean, coming from C, you can understand Java and it helps you. I mean, you don't need to do memory management. I, I, at school, I learned C and I thought, oh shit. I mean, Memory leaks are everywhere when you write C programs. With Java, memory leaks happen, but they are quite easy to understand if you have some experience. And most of normal people don't create memory leaks when they do an average program. I want a language that is simple to use, that is simple to maintain, that is simple to read. And with Scala, I... <laughs> That is my personal opinion. So I don't experience that, but my personal opinion is that Scala people are so smart, they want to show off by using Scala. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, even the guy who wrote the stuff six months after couldn't read it. <laughs> I might be exaggerating, but you know, no? Who says no? No. Enjoy is the same. No, Java, eh, to create complicated stuff in Java is possible, but it requires extra effort. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see my point, right? Yeah, sure. yeah. So, that is my problem. So, I want something that prevents me from doing mistakes. Not by using macros everywhere and implicit, and yeah, yeah, it's injected right there because it's in the namespace, yeah, but... You know, implicit conversion are really crazy. Yeah, 
I mean, and you have to check. I, I, I couldn't do, really not, don't know that. Sorry? I, I'm using this, I know that. So? <laughs> Are evil. Yeah, the implicits are evil, but it, it, it's allowed. I mean, it's part of the stuff. And the, the, the most Scala developers will say, yeah, we are using implicit. You don't know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know what it is. I still think that it's harder to maintain code that uses a lot of implicit. It allows you to do super cool tricks, but I don't care about those cool tricks. I don't want you to be to showing off, I want the application to be readable by average developers. That's my beef with Scala. Most Scala developers are way smarter than me. I have no problem with that. But I want my code to be maintainable, and that is not possible in Scala currently. Hmm? That is possible with Kotlin. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my, what I think, and we can discuss it afterwards if you want. OK, anyway. So here I showed you the val, the var, uh, how the default parameters, thanks to you, the named parameters. And also, Kotlin makes the code more terse, not more concise, but more expressive. And since the code is more expressive, then basically, if it was like Java, you would end up putting a lot of very small code into dedicated files, and you will have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of files. And again, like Scala, Kotlin allows you to put different classes into the same file. So what is related can stay inside. If I'm using only the welcome class here, in, sorry, in Java, I would have a not public class into the same, or an inner class here, but I mean, it's not relevant. I put it into the same file, they have their own existence, but still they can collaborate. And also something that is that takes that is strange to, to think of, but in Java basically your code is like this. You don't use the whole space, the whole width. I mean it's space wasting. But you never look at your at your code like that. Yeah, you don't care, you just write your stuff and but you have to use the scrolling bars. And in Kotlin, you use more width. So you can fit more into your screen. Th that's stupid to think at least like that, but it's true. And I mean, the screen is your window into the code. So the bigger the window, the more you can fit into your brain at, at a time. And I remember, eh? so I need to have big window. Okay. But next you need a bigger printer to print it all. Who prints his code now? <laughs> <laughs> but what if customer pays me for the lines of code? Ah, the uh, always the same shit. Then you should change customer. You should move away from the India. <laughs> <laughs> My first project. Yeah, I hope it's not the case anymore. By the way, uh, if you want to uh, having this kind of discussion, you know that uh, like way, way back, a manager, like they, are already, uh, they all have uh, paid super handsomely to do nothing. So at some time they have to pretend to have a good idea. Okay? That he decided that, okay, so in order to improve the quality, I would pay for the number of bugs found by testers. What happened? <laughs> yeah, the number of bugs increased because before, yeah, the developers and the testers talked together before <laughs> in order not to create bugs. But so, the, the, you know, it's all about the metrics. If you put stupid metrics, people will adapt to stupid metrics. So if you are paid by the number of lines of code, yeah, you better write Java code than Kotlin code. <laughs> if your productivity is measured by the number of lines of code you produce, what happens to your productivity when you remove lines of code? You have negative productivity. <laughs> because, <coughs> but uh, when you imagine to, to branches, 
or branch uh, into uh, matter and you have uh, two columns on the left and on the right and uh, with the cotton you have to uh, scroll horizontal. Okay, that's a good good comment. I didn't happen to me now again because I'm just playing with that. I'm not I'm not putting that in production yet. I'm not collaborating with people. I, I, I didn't run into this problem. But it's not because you can write a lot that you should, right? Okay, so again, you have to be relevant. I mean, Kotlin is meant for you to write more maintainable code. So that, again, that's, it's not because it allows you that you should do it. In that case, I would, no. The goal is to write maintainable code. My problem is to write maintainable code. So I use Kotlin for what it's meant for. And I, uh, yeah, this is good enough. I, will, I, I can show you afterwards. I have uh, created another class in, in one of my projects that has a lot of attributes, of properties, and I've set it every on its own line because I want it to be readable. Mm -hmm. So remind me when I will show you my other project. I will show you the class in question. Sorry, in this class, uh, in this class uh, welcome class is uh, acceptable from the another class of that. Could be reached. Could be reached. Yeah, because in Kotlin, who here writes public classes in Java? Uh, everybody. No, some people are not putting... Yeah, you not, okay. <laughs> you are writing public classes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And every time you have to write public. So 99% of the case you are writing public classes. And 99% you are just writing five characters plus space. For nothing. 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 By default, Kotlin says public is default. Because by default, it's public. So it can be rich because this class is public. You just don't see it. But now you know it. Yeah, and you can also generate it or vomit it out. Yeah, it's also the same problem. Hey, look, I don't know, need nothing for equals and hash code because my IDE generates it. Then you add a new attribute, and what, guess what? It can regenerate. Yeah, but no, nobody does it because, hey, you know. Uh, no, that's a problem. Generation is good, but it's one shot. You, I, I, I don't want that. Okay, next step. And here, it's even better because, oh, it has, it's even better, there is no code at all. <laughs> it's it, the best that can happen. Super. I really doesn't want to. Just close the package and open it again. Okay, I will do that. Yeah, хорошо. Okay. Senior developer. <laughs> and here I say, okay, since all my controls are one-liners, I put every one of them into the same file. And again, here, my window is really used to the maximum. Think about it. It doesn't seem like much, but it's super important. Okay, of course, we are, it's not only about Kotlin, it's about Spring Boot. So let's do some injection. <coughs> so if you like to use auto wire, I hate it personally, but if you, but since so many people want to write it here. So this is what I wrote, uh, what you, uh, I don't remember uh, before you, 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 you deserve a bag and you as well. No, not you. 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 Uh, here, I set it to private so nobody can access it. Because generally, that's what you do. You inject services into your controllers and you don't have getters and setters. So it's possible. You do the same stuff. Of course, you don't forget to say it's a value because it can never, never change. So that's one reason why you should not ever do any setter injection. Hmm? Who does setter injection? Yeah, look around you too, you, you will be telling. Oh no! 
Oh no, not you. <laughs> no, don't worry. The guy behind you was ashamed, but also is waving his hand. Cyber injection is very important that we have diplomatic dependency. No, you are making me very afraid. You want cyclomatic dependency? Yes. No, you don't want it. <laughs> Sorry, you? If you have diplomatic dependency, you won't be able to do constructor injection. Yeah, the pro you don't think the problem is, is a circular dependency? <laughs> we will talk about it afterwards. <laughs> you don't want circular dependency. You don't want chicken and egg problem. Never. Yeah, but sometimes no, not never. <laughs> the, it's not open to debate. No, really. You never want it. Yes. Uh, no, you still. You already have your bag. It's okay. <laughs> I, don't, I have a lot of those bags. <coughs> uh, constructor uh, has our uh, undated with autoward. So uh, does it mean that all uh, fields in this constructor listed one by one will be autoward? Yes, that, but that's um, that's uh, spring stuff, basically. Uh, Normally, what you should do in normal Java, you put the auto-wired on the constructor. And I think even that in the latest version of Spring, it's even not necessary. It will be automatically detected that you need that and that, and it will take it out of the context. But I, I, again, I, I will have to check, but I think in the latest version, it's been done. So here, because again, we like merge the class declaration and the constructor, then we have to use the keyword constructor. That's the only difference. That's a, a, a little more typing. And here you use auto wired, and it is as if you annotated the constructor with auto wiring. Okay? The rest is the same stuff. And here we can, you can use the service as in any other way. Did, did it answer your question? Good. And here I have all the welcome relevant stuff, not into the same package like I would do in Java, but into the same file directly because it's super expressive. Yeah, uh, Evgeny Dmitri, it was for you. Those are not standard names where I live. So now what I want to do is to use Spring Data GPA. So here again, I create an entity. I add an ID and those are values. And here I just wanted to show that how can you add multiple constructors? Because by using GPA, normally you would need an empty constructor with getter setters. Here, I'm just too lazy to create getters and setters, but I want to create an, em an empty constructor. So here I say, it uses no argument, and it will call the default constructor with empty string and empty string. It's just two. So this is how you can create multiple constructors. Again, generally 99% of the case, you don't need that, but it's possible, and if it's possible, you need to do it. And yeah, again, this you annotate the who with the ID of the stuff. And why, why do you need this if you have default values? <laughs> That's a good question. You don't need them if you have default values, but here I don't have yeah. default values. Here I just wanted to show the uh, uh, multiple constructor stuff. You had me worried for a moment. <laughs> Now I told you that I hate, I really hate auto wiring. I want to have dedicated injection. Why? Why? So auto wiring is evil because basically you put stuff into the context and you trust the framework engine to pick the one that you need everywhere. Now is in this context, you put another candidate anywhere to break. So with any decent size application, at some point you are bound to run into trouble. So that's why I always advocate to use explicit injection. Also with explicit injection, you can follow the trail. 
So here, I still kept my controllers, okay? I still kept my welcome entity, and th those are meant to be magically auto-scanned by Spring. Entities are meant to be scanned by Spring. And in my Kotlin demo injection, I created a bin, a bin class, right? Again, it's like normal Java configuration. I, I, I could have created a decoded class, but here it's, uh, it's too small. Okay. And here I say, okay, in the controller, I, and here I remove the auto-wired, because in that case I'm sure that it works, uh, I will inject a repository, and I will create the controller with the service with the repository. That would be the same in Java as if I would have said service equals new service and pass the controller in argument and return new controller with the service in argument. It's just nesting, controller, uh, nesting constructor calls. So here, again, one-liner. It's very easy and it's just plumbing. So I don't need anything be uh, behind that. What does uh, open modifier mean? Ah, open modifier. Okay, I wanted to avoid that. Okay, but we have a problem. Let's keep it between us, right? We have a problem. By default, Kotlin people are also super smart. And they thought, hmm, you know about the open close principle. Okay, so by default, all classes should be public, but should be final. It was a good idea, again, like checked exceptions. But it's, with Spring, it doesn't work. Because basically, configuration classes and bin methods need to be non-final, because they will be extended by Spring at runtime. So, you have to say, this is not final. So, in Kotlin, you say, this is open. I don't have a third bag, this is also a good question. But you were too late. So, in the previous example, welcome service should be open as well. What, what should be a... Uh, um and in the previous example, when you showed uh, the open service, the open service, that's a bin. And it would be in the runtime dynamic process. So it should be open. No, because here it's injected by auto-wiring. And in that case, it's, it's a little more complicated in Kotlin to use explicit wiring than auto-wiring. It happens. Um, we still have a little time, right? Uh, here, what did I want to show you? I don't remember, so I will skip that. <laughs> oh yeah, that is interesting. So if you know about Java 8, of course, it's not super great. But basically, you can have like those kind of functional programming stuff. So you don't need, when you have a collection, you don't need to stream it. It's automatically, you've got the map, the filter, the whatever you want. And you can pass it lambdas and do whatever you want. Um, what is interesting is, by default, you don't need, as in Java, to declare the name of the parameter. By default, like in Groovy, it will be IT, it. So again, it's a little more concise. Okay, getting back on track. Um, so the last part of my presentation, I would just like to show you uh, what I did for my blog, because again, I want to play. And I had my blog on WordPress. And who, who knows about WordPress? Uh, half the room. So WordPress is a PHP blog, blah, blah, blah. So it means it's in PHP. 
So you have got all the, the bad stuff about PHP. You, you've got like uh, um, coding problems. You've got uh, openness to some attacks. And also on, on top of that, you've got WordPress. So you've got even more possibility of attacks. So every time you had to uh, update WordPress, you had to update your plugins. And when someone comes to your page, of course, it takes time for you to render the page. You might cache it, but it was really not great. So already I, I migrated one, uh, uh, another one of my blog into, into Jekyll. And Jekyll is super great because basically you write Markdown, Markdown, Markdown format, so kind of HTML stuff. And afterward, it generates the whole site for you and you put the static files online. So static files means no security hole, very quick to render and to serve, and it's a no-brainer. So if you are a developer, don't use WordPress, just use this kind of stuff. Jekyll is one of those static blog generators. It works super well. I'm very happy about it so far. And so I wanted to migrate from WordPress to Jekyll. And basically, this is a batch scenario because I have one big XML export for all my WordPress posts, like eight years, eight years of blogging, and I want to create like dedicated markdown posts. Read the XML file, okay? I want to extract every article out of it, and then I want to transform stuff. Like I noticed that some, if not most, of my images had no size. So when you want to do HTML, it's better to add the size because it lets the browser know about the size so it can compute already. It doesn't need to download the image to compute it. I wanted to replace the links also because some of the links were pointing to HTTP, blog, blog, and I wanted relative links. I wanted to do some other transformation. I don't remember them. And in the end, I want to write Markdown files. So if you have such a scenario and you want to use Spring Boot and Kotlin, what do you want to use? Spring Boot and Kotlin. you? I just repeated your last sentence. Ah, you want to repeat my last sentence. Because no, that you have understood that when you say something, then I will shame you in front of all people and you don't want it. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> I won't use cyclic stuff. but. <laughs> Um, so this is a scenario for what? For what brick of, of spring of spring boots? Guys. Spring MVC? Is it a job for Spring MVC? No, it's in the rain. It's a, 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 a spring batch scenario. Oh, spring integration, yeah, but uh, I'm lazy again, so I wanted just to use simple spring batch. Okay. So, <clears throat> what I want to show you into my code, which is the most important stuff, is I will show you how to use expression body stuff. So, how to fit into one file. And also, the, I told you extension, there are extension methods and extension properties. And I will show you extension properties. <clears throat> so, expression body is when you have the equal signs and just one-liners. So here is a code. <coughs> so it's not super big. Basically, you've got, as I said, the reader. And here I just use the standard Spring Batch stuff. I just configure how it reads the XML. I have the writer, which is a little more interesting. And I have a lot of processors. For example, this one will just add the image size, okay? <coughs> but here I have also this one. And here is interesting because I changed the content, but super, super st stupid stuff. And so I have a lot of processors into the same class because I, I don't do like, I will rep replace uh, links to HTTPS GIST to the Jekyll directive to do that. I will replace uh, 
href or ossoc to https blog my blog to just slash to have relative links. I will replace three line breaks with two ones. I mean, that is not, super, that is not rocket science. So I can put all of them into the same file. I can read them super easily. So for me, that is super interesting because instead of reading this one and putting it into its own file and opening a lot of files, I can open that and see everything. Uh, so I wanted to tell you about expression, um, about um, extension properties. This is very, very interesting. So you already know about extension methods and here I say extension property. So as you can imagine, methods are for functions and property are for attributes. So I have something, a class called blog entry and basically a blog entry you remember your question? I just put one line because I don't want it to be like extra long. Again, it's for readability purpose. Um, a blog entry basically is just mapped to one thing in the XML. Mm -hmm. So it takes the title, it takes the name, the published, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, when I want to write it, when I want to write it, now I want to call something called Jekyll file name. And it's not in XML. So in UML, it would be seen as a computed property. So in Java, I would have, what could I have done? I could have transformed the blog entry into a Jekyll blog entry. I could have created uh, more um, utils stuff. But in all this case, either it adds to runtime uh, overhead, like transforming for no real reason, or it adds to uh, readability uh, problems. With Jekyll, I just created a new property, a new attribute. And I say that when someone calls get Jekyll file name, then if it's of type page or the status is draft, then the name is that. If the status is publish, then the name is that, or else then it throw a runtime exception. And also you can see here the when there is no case in Kotlin, there is a when. And again, for our Scala friends here, you, you have the same syntax. So when first condition, when second condition, and else to make it complete. Yes. Uh, <coughs> this extension will be exposed uh, available on the in this class and yes. outside. Yes, cool. exactly the point. And that is really it can really ease your writing because then here it's it was just to show off because here I only use it here so it's not very important I could have written it inside but not in interesting something which I didn't write but you can see also here is you can write functions inside functions how stupid is that I mean what's the point of that because in Java when you write a, f a method and it is too big, what do you do? Split. You split it, okay? So what happens? At the, at the top level of your class, you have a lot of private methods, which are used only once. Mm -hmm. So it clutters the namespace of your class. If it's used only once, why put it into the namespace of your class? It should be depend. It, the, the, Real good scope should be the method itself. So Kotlin lets you do that. It's really great. Okay, I think that you have enough. I would just like to conclude that the key takeaways to this stuff is that Spring Boot loves Kotlin. <laughs> that uh, Java loves Kotlin. Java? Yeah, I mean, uh, can they survive in a parallel with a single project? Yes, yes. Um, I, I didn't highlight it here, but again, the point for JetBrains was not to migrate their IDEs to Kotlin in one Bing Bang because it would be infeasible, but it wa it's really a design decision from the start that Java and Kotlin must be nice partners so that you can migrate really slowly at your own pace.
So there is no example here, but you can try to just try one class and to add it, and you will see how easy it is. Um, I, I, I also try to play with Android, and Kotlin is super nicely used in Android. They really love it. Really, I tried Android, I think, I tried Android like four or five years ago. It was really hard to write when you are used to Java server side. Then I tried it like one year ago, one year and a half, and I said, it's still super low level API and stuff. It's really hard to, to write. Uh, and then I tried Kotlin and I said, wow, it's so good. And I migrated my application bit by bit and it works super pretty well. You can mix Java and Kotlin files in one? That's the point. That's the point. That's really one of the main key driver and really something that Scala doesn't do well. It's you can mix very nicely. Again, it's because JetBrains wanted it, it's, it's a key pro decision. Um, so, um, you st can still ask questions, you can uh, check my blog, you can follow me on Twitter, become my friend on LinkedIn, uh, you can have the, um, the um, source code for uh, the second stuff that I showed you, like uh, the, the Spring Boot Kotlin stuff, and uh, I have one copy of my book, the first one, uh, can come to me to get it.